So today we're going to uh, be talking about the uh, Module Shaper project, uh, which is a project I started working on during my uh, master's, uh, and that's something I, I'm still actually working on because uh, the aim of this is actually to make uh, this uh, project real. Um, so I've been uh, working lately with, uh, with David on uh, one, uh, one part of the, of, of the project, which is about actually uh, using virtual reality um, to, to design uh, a shelter. There are three main technologies. We can call them new technologies, actually, for the public, which is uh, virtual reality, 3D printing, uh, and um, drones, the use of drones. So what I'm gonna, gonna do now is just to, to actually uh, talk a little bit about the, the, the project, and then we're gonna go on to the uh, VR, uh, virtual reality uh, use. Disaster issues caused by nature or war are affecting people all over the world and can occur at any time. One significant and frequently occurring result of disasters is that a large proportion of the local population are displaced, losing their home in other, under terrible circumstances. The Modishata Research Project is focused on the resolution of this current worldwide issue and propose the creation of sustainable shelters for refugee camps that can improve the living conditions of <coughs> inhabitants in the camps. Shelters play an important role in protecting people from the elements, as well as supporting the recreation of communities, which is recognized as a key factor in improving the personal well-being of refugees who have lost everything. The use of tents as a first response in shelter provision following a disastrous occurrence is still considered as the most effective solution for the very short term. However, it is crucial to develop a solution for the medium and long term before the displaced population is able to move back into traditional housing. The project has been designed as a solution for this transition period between tents and housing, which can last for several years. Large tent cities are currently growing as refugees flee disaster areas and frequently result in very poor living conditions. Numerous issues such as extreme temperatures, lack of hygiene, or contagious illnesses affect the refugees who require a proper habitat during the transition period. The aim of the Modi Shelter Research Project is to design a modular and efficient construction system to build temporary habitats combining sustainable materials and 3D printing technologies in order to improve living standards in emergency situations. The proposition is that the modular nature of the design will result in the ability to create singular units that offer suitable shelter with the possibility to evolve them into compounds of several houses as required. The flexibility of the system also able to generate other type of construction such as sanitation facilities, schools, common rooms, places of worship. The module shelter will be transportable, easily modifiable to accommodate the user's needs, adaptable to a sudden change of situation, as well as upgradable to a higher standard. Emergency shelters are often unsustainable in terms of cost and environmental issues, are they are made to be temporary. This new construction system is aiming to combine efficiency and sustainability to produce a shelter that can evolve with the user. The Modi Shelter construction system is composed of three main elements, which are um, a connector, a beam, <coughs> and a panel, um, and which are being entirely manufactured using large scale 3D printers. The manufacturing will occur in an existing airplane hangar close to the disaster area, facilitating the supply of sustainable building materials and transport of ready-made units. Alternatively, all parts could be manufactured in advance and stored as self-containing units ready to be shipped as a first response to disasters. The lightweight quality components can be reassembled in the shape of containers to be ideally transported by large drones, so they can be dropped into areas as needed. The container boxes are intended to be opened and assembled by the refugees themselves. 
who would be using a simple instruction leaflet similar to what's come with uh, furnitures from IKEA. And uh, there will also be uh, space inside of them to transport food, water, and first aid kits. Being fully modular, the modular shelter have the capacity to be easily disassembled and transported to the new area in case of a sudden change of situation or dismantlement uh, of the refugee camp and keep it, can be reused for a new purpose when villages have been reconstructed. This modular system does not require any tool, only a minimal effort from two people who will lock pieces into place by tightening them using a quick release system similar to those found on bicycle wheels. Due to the easy manipulation, refugees or those inhabiting, inhabiting the homes can have input uh, into their exact need as well as upgrading later. It's hoped that the versatility of the design will enable the refugees to be creative and provide them with some ownership uh, of their habitat and regain dignity through a very tough situation. So this uh, first part of the project actually when, when um, the, the shelter are going to be designed, they are going to be designed by the refugees themselves within the refugee camp. So the question was actually how do we um, uh, able those refugees to uh, access uh, designing to, to actually create something which will be suitable for them first and not just having a container being dropped uh, or just a tent because uh, there is, um, when we see it for the, the refugee camp in Calais for example, there are uh, with containers with actually only one person living inside or up to 12. Um, and then we actually we need something, a, a habitat which can actually evolve and, and, um, and so on. So we're going to be talking now uh, about the uh, virtual reality and how we can use this technology um, to, to help uh, refugees design their own shelter. Because when you use, you, you are going to, to, to see it in the short run with, with David, um, when you use uh, a virtual reality, you're actually inside shelter and you build everything is all, uh, I would say, tactile. Um, very intuitive, so you don't need to know any software skills. Um, it's pretty much uh, you are designing everything, uh, modifying, looking around, and then uh, when you uh, agree to that, it's been sent to be printed. Um, yes. Should I'll we talk through that bit if you like? Absolutely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm, I'm going to say everything I'm going to say, and then I'll be run out of things to say. Um, <laughs> So I think something that's been really interesting um, is that obviously Antoine comes from a design background. He's more inter he's interested in making physical, real things. And uh, where we first met up was uh, because um, <coughs> I'd never actually seen any, uh, held anything in my hands that I'd made um, because I deal in the digital world and I don't very often print anything. So when Antoine came came to me with this uh, this suggest this idea. Um, Initially, I thought, great, as a games designer, it's, it, it works perfectly because we work in modular environments and this is kind of our bread and butter and how things work. So it, it was quite an exciting idea to make something real but using the same rules and the same toys that we use um, for uh, making virtual environments. Um, so, I mean, the first thing we kind of did was uh, Antoine explained to me the, the sort of thought process he'd gone through in designing his physical shelters. Um, and while I sort of sat there and tried to make notes and understand exactly how these things sort of put together um, with the best of understanding from my Lego experience of the past. <laughs> That's it, yeah. um, so I've got, I've got some stuff to show as well of how I've had the sort of process we went through to converting physical design into virtual design. Um, but some of the interesting things was that uh, we were looking at, we've kind of both learned from the process along the way um, because I found ways that Antoine could work more efficiently by writing calculators and algorithms to solve problems rather than doing things manually. But equally, Antoine shared some things with me that, that I'd never thought of doing, working quite in, in that way as well. So it's, it's been really sort of interesting to work in this sort of interdisciplinary. It was very actually interesting to, to see, to, to reverse engineer everything I had designed. <laughs> so we actually we, we took all, all the different parts and try to actually make it uh, again in, into this uh, virtual reality uh, application because all the thoughts, everything I've been uh, 
I used a year for that, <coughs> and we actually have, we had to go back and, and translate it into into what uh, David is going to to show you. So that was very very uh, very interesting. Shall I show them my uh, my calculator? Sure. So, <laughs> just plug this one here. Yeah, just that one. Um, so it was quite was fine issues as well in my design. Yeah, it was. It which was, we actually <laughs> <had any laughs> now to actually to go back and and, and re. Uh, so yeah, one, one of the um, interesting things that we started with was, uh, so I, I apologize for showing designers Excel, but <laughs> it was the best tool for the job. <laughs> um, the first time we met after the initial suggestion of the project, um, I showed Antoine some photographs of my whiteboard, which was covered in formulas. Yes. And I said to him, well, that's, that's what was I in your head. <laughs> because uh, designers, we are actually physical, we are looking for physical things, and then you actually translated everything into mathematics, I would say. Yeah, it yes. sort of went backwards from what it started. So um, what, was, what I was trying to do was trying to distill his design into some logic that I could place objects in the scene and give them no information other than the, pe the objects around them and let it interpret from that what units, what modules, what sides, what components would happen. So the, the general idea was that I could put a connector down and say, there are three connectors around you get on with it, and it would know from the information that it has of there are four connectors next to each other, what panels, which components were needed. Which was, because when I spoke to Antoine, he said that, uh, that he was having to manually work out on paper how many C7 connectors and how many C10s yes. and how many C4s. Um, and you my my favourite connector is amazing. Fun. <laughs> um, um, you get so, <laughs> a list of what you need. Yeah, so after, after working from that, um, I'll explain this very briefly. Uh, but these are my samples uh, uh, for, the, for the, uh, the people who are used to sort of digital working. Um, I should, I've got a slight diagram which is just off screen, so I'll just bring that across there. So I've got this, uh, this diagram here. Let's make it a bit bigger. Uh, this diagram here is. Uh, oops, other way, sorry. Um, this little diagram here is basically the logic from it. So in the center is the, the connector that we're talking about, that's the, uh, the discussion point. Mm -hmm. And then you've got A, B, C, and D around it in the green. And those are the, the neighbours, as we call them. Um, and that's where it's going to work out all of this information from. So we've got this, uh, this spreadsheet all the way down here, um, which allows... This was my first stage of the tool, because initially I was working out all manually, trying to check all my formulas and make sure everything worked. Um, but it became easier to write a very quick simulator, and this is a top-down view of my modular shelter. And the ones in, indicate a, uh, a, a segment that is going to have a connector, and the zeros are ones that don't. A floor plan. It's a floor plan, yes. <laughs> With numbers. <laughs> With numbers, yeah. <laughs> um, and that's our input. So that's what we want to put into the system. And what it generates from that is it works out where the pillars are going to be. It works out where we need to put floor tiles. Um, we're still working on the roof. <laughs> yes. Because yes. one thing we realized as well is that there was two kinds of logic in the design. There was the nodal logic from one node to the next, where it said, uh, I, I can work out that because there's a connector there, I need to put a beam between me and the next connector. Um, however, things like the, the roof, where it undulates up and down, yes. we weren't able to sample it from the connectors themselves. So we've actually got to have to have a systematic approach that overloads, uh, overrides it at the end. So that's why we're still working on the roof at the moment. Um, we've also got wall panels which have to be reversed, and if they're reversed, they need a slightly different uh, uh, setup. Uh, so we had to do that as well, and then then side to side as well. So this is our general simulator. It is live, so we can kind of chuck some numbers in here, and you'll see that the uh, the shape of the building changes as I've taken out those squares, and it's now adapted. And this was the uh, the first glitch we found. With, That's with, the first with one, actually. This yes. was the problem we found with, that, with, the, with yes. the design. What happened with the connector when actually we put it one this way? Yeah, yeah. so when we had our, our beam, we had our connector, we found that actually an internal angle on the, on the way the system that had been designed didn't work because the two parts clash mm. and overlap. In, in the virtual world, it just shows up as a glitch, and I, can, I just said to Antoine, I said, did you realise this doesn't work? So it would actually be much faster <laughs> being a system in design to actually go back to uh, um, and find issues and have a result. Yes. Because uh, the, the sorry, difficulty about uh, this design is actually everything is fully modular. So all the parts can be moved around. You can add another floor, you can add uh, another room, you can uh, so everything is made compatible with each other, uh, as well with the internal partitions, how you attach actually an internal <coughs> partition and make it as simple as possible. 
Yeah, so you effectively had, um, if I remember correctly, there was 10 different kinds of connectors, theoretically, um, yeah, which have the various configurations. Yeah, yeah. You haven't added more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, that's the, the spreadsheet, and I shall leave that to it and go move on to pictures. Um, so then what we, what we were looking at was we were looking at a problem um, in that we can do all of this wonderful stuff on our high-powered computers and our desks, and we can work on this, uh, you know, work on these simulations of designs. But the, the, the problem that we were thinking about was um, how we get it in the hands of people who don't ne aren't necessarily computer literate, aren't necessarily inclined to want to sit there and work out how to use the machine, but actually they just have a fundamental need of being able to design their home with no knowledge at all. Mm. So, um, and equally, uh, in, a, in a completely alien world, of poss possibly they've not come across digital technology and these things as well. Um, and in an environment where it's not conducive to good safety. So what we were looking at was how we could um, come up with a way of providing them with the digital design tools that we're all used to um, and <coughs> trans transform it into a user experience that they would be able to understand with no knowledge of computer systems. Mm. Or design. Or design. <laughs> so, right, sorry, I'm just having to swap cables here because we don't have a switch. Um, so the objective was that we would, in the long term, this system would be able to be deployed on something such as a um, what's known as a Gear VR headset, uh, which works off a mobile phone. Um, in the future, we're still at the prototype stage, and some of this technology doesn't work together yet, but could in the future. The idea being that we would uh, so here's, here's just a, in the quick 3D simulation of it. Um, the idea would be that we could drop a headset with the phone inside it, with all the sensors we need, in a small box with an illustration saying you need to put it to your face. Um, once you put it to your face, you're now inside the shelter or outside and able to, in an ideal world, would be, include some kind of scanning equipment that would be able to walk around the area where you want to put the shelter. It would then ascertain the size of the space that you would be able to use. It would put that ground inside the VR so that you know that's, that's the space I can work with. Um, we would then be using, um, a, we're using, for this system, we're using a, a system called Leap Motion, which works on your hands, so there's no controls um, as far as uh, controls. We're, we're demoing it with a controller because we don't have the uh, touch panel on the side of the Gear VR we need. Um, <laughs> but the idea being that it's completely hands-on because most people know how to touch a button or press a switch or touch something in the real world. So we're extrapolating from that um, into our virtual simulation, the virtual environment. I'll just load up the actual thing and I'll, do you want to go in? Uh, sure. So uh, I'm just going to load our simulator. Oops, that would be the wrong level. Sorry, excuse me a second. Uh, trying to bring your chairs for conference. <laughs> We're suffering a bit from cable. Um, the <laughs> the final model would be entirely wireless, but uh, we're just uh, trying going on here. Um, so Antoine is my guinea pig. Um, right, is it? Can you see what's going on? Because I lost the window. That's um, as Microsoft saying, never do anything. <laughs> I just uh, this and start it again. Press the one button, I suspect. Uh, yes. Okay. I mean, yeah. Okay. Can you see your hands? Can you get us away? Thanks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you're the one control to me. Right. So, this is our initial prototype of uh, the Modo Shelter Designer. Um, as you can see, it's appropriate scale to the user. So um, I believe we made um, our user approximately five foot eight, as <coughs> an estimation. Um, the other nice thing is that you can actually, um, well, I mean, Antoine will tell you that his first experience would probably be good of uh, being inside your design. That was very, very amazing because that's, that's actually a tool that designers don't, uh, don't usually have. And, and when, when you have the possibility to actually enter the design to actually interact with it, it's, it's totally different, it's uh, especially for, for architecture 
Um, so instead of actually building a very small uh, scale prototype, we can actually be uh, inside and uh, interact with it. So I'll show you here. Uh, so inside the, inside the shelter. So what are we doing now? I'm actually approaching a panel here, and you get uh, a common here, which opens. You put your hand through it, and you can actually change in between uh, for different uh, options. So this could be uh, for different kind of panel. So if I press on this one, so you see the panel now is actually changing into a wall. Or oh, fix the um, multiple selections. You have, okay, great. <laughs> um, I go to this one, and I would say, uh, now I think this was uh, a door. So here you go. So here's the door. Needless to say, we would add icons that would suggest what the things are. Yes. Um, but at the moment, we're uh, still in the early stages. Can yeah. I still uh, walk? That's not meant to happen. You? That's not meant to happen. Okay. <laughs> you can have internal partition as well. <laughs> that's that's the that's was the next that's 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 coming like soon. <laughs> It's coming very soon. Um, so you can see actually, I can just oh, we've got another one here. Oh, I've broken something. I was trying to fix a bug earlier, and it looks like I've added more um, bugs than fix necessarily. Um, so, like <laughs> your petitions have gone viral. <laughs> They've gone viral. So, yeah, the the idea being that you can go into this this environment and you can use your hands, and you don't have to worry about using the computer as it as it were. Um, you can interact with it, and then by the, when you've designed the environment, you'll be able to place it in some furniture and see what it looks like with a bed and a chair and that kind of. Um, and then the objective would be that the final stage of it is that because this thing's a mobile phone attached to the, in the whole system, is that you would be able to then say, right, that's great, we want that order. That then sends the data, assuming we've managed to establish some kind of internet connectivity, which is something that I found really interesting when I visited Africa and uh, the, some of the, uh, Africa recently was that actually their 4G connect, 3G connectivity was better than it is here because they never had landlines, so they have great <laughs> mobile phone connectivity. And equally, there's been a lot of work from Google um, and uh, other technology providers to actually give better connectivity in these places after disasters. So we can, I think, given the timescales we're looking at, we can assume that there would be connectivity um, after these uh, disasters. Mm -hmm. The idea being that we can then send that information back to um, uh, Antoine's uh, factory that makes all the parts, yes. and then can then use the GPS within the phone to then target the delivery, send the drone uh, over there. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's a full solution. The whole idea is that um, the system does all the analysis and all the hard work of is the ground flat, is it is this a good place? Because we can assess the uh, terrain using the system as well. So we can highlight this is a safe place to build it because it's flat. Um, we can then design it so it will fit in that space using the scanning equipment that will be built into the device. We can then design, make sure that the windows facing the nice view rather than the brick wall um, through um, visualization. And then finally, we can order and deliver the final solution. Um, and to, to boot, it means that you're then left with a useful, uh, a useful phone that can then give you communications. Um, so that would be the idea that instead of us having to drop a whole uh, lab of equipment in, we can drop a simple headset in a box um, on a parachute or fire drone, yes, um, fire drone yes. straight away uh, and give that kind of uh, solution that the, the people on the ground can design. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's it. And that's, um, yeah. The virtual reality is actually <laughs> very, very important to, to, to take on board for the future of design. Because actually with uh, those computers we lost uh, the physicality of what we are designing because we are not uh, able to interact uh, with it. Uh, and this is actually, that's a second world which is digital, but then you actually uh, realize how <coughs> it is. Uh, you can move it around, you can actually uh, put your work with your hands actually on the object uh, and then get, get it uh, printed. So, um, so yeah, this show the example of the actual unit. Sure. Uh, to give you an example of the kind of thing we were actually up to, um, so this this is what uh, this thing looks like in Antoine's head. Um, um, well, yeah. <laughs> so this this, this is the digital interpretation of the design workflow that he went through um, to to actually uh, build it. Um, I would explain it, but it is about twelve to fifteen pages long. If anyone has the disposition, I'm more than happy to. 
explain it in more detail. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it all comes down to, as I was saying before, with the neighbours, there's the four neighbours, and then all the red stuff is the logic saying if there's a neighbour there or if there isn't. So yeah, mm -hmm. um, other than the glitch that I just managed to introduce <laughs> into the system the last half an hour, um, so we've been working quite well. And the, the nice thing about this is that then when we um, just put this into Sorry, this projector is So one of the nice things about this is actually they're all the same objects. I've just changed the pits in the box. Mm -hmm. So um, by changing the, uh, as I said before, I've got like a grid of ticks. So uh, it's 36 long at the moment, so it's uh, six rows of six. Uh, by changing the ticks, I can change the design, um, and it automatically gives us a part listing of each of those as we do it. Um, so in future iterations, we're looking to add interfaces so that you can push the walls out, put partitions up, and all of that as part of it. Um, and that means it's completely transparent to both the designer and to the user at the other end. Uh, they don't have to worry about what kind of connector it is because it knows the rules. It knows there's the rules already. So <laughs> yeah, we've already built the rules. Uh, so it's, it's uh, structurally safe as well. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what's very, very important because you don't have any architects involved actually in designing. Design your building. That's why it's safe. <laughs> Couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. What's the most, what, what do you feel is the unknown technology at the moment? You know, you said, well, there are a few things that are this. Obviously, a lot of this is known technology, yeah. isn't it? Because you've done it. Which yes. Is, I did it actually. Um, Really interesting. What, where do you feel at the moment the unknowns are kind of? What, what are those like at the moment? What's the, the, main, the main trouble at the moment is, yeah. is the, the technology is there, but the connectivity isn't. Right, okay. So, whereas I've got, you know, I, I bought this sensor from a shop. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a standard piece of kit. But how much is that product? How much um, cost is that? At the moment, this is about 400. Right, okay, um, but, yeah. but then a thousand pound computer on the floor to run it. Um, right, but when okay. you look at a Gear VR kind of setup, so where it's a mobile phone and then a plastic box yeah. to put the phone in and hold it against your face, you're looking about six hundred all in. But obviously, if you bought, if you, you know, bulk buy and that kind yeah. of thing, um, and although it's expensive, it can be used for the entire. You know, you can have three or four of these and share them around. It's not like you need one. It's not disposable, it's no, not like no. the job's done right away. Yeah. It's, it's, it's got longevity to it as well. Because that there was something really interesting that I, uh, sorry, we'll go back to the point. No, no, yeah, yeah. Something that I found very interesting was um, I was watching a, uh, a, a mockumentary, documentary video someone had done um, that showed that one of the things they discovered with a lot of the, uh, the people moving from Syria to, to escape the troubles there was the one thing that they brought with them was a mobile phone. Mm -hmm. Everyone, everyone turned up with a smartphone because actually that's your line to your family, that's your photos, that's your... You it's know, everything. If, it's, it's that question, isn't it? That doesn't, I know this question of if you had to go and leave everything, what's the one thing you take with you? And it'd be my photo albums, my music, my list of phone numbers for my friends and my family. So actually, if we, can, if we can target that device, that's the one thing that's got value and we're also providing them with that device. So going back to your question, um, a lot of this is, con is standard hardware, uh, but it's the connectivity. So that sensor currently doesn't work with the smartphone because they have uh, they don't have the right kind of connected, uh, like USB bus can can't handle it at the moment. But they are working on it. Mm -hmm. So in a year's time, I might be able to go to Leap Motion and say, "Can I have a cable that plugs the two together?" And I'll say, "Sure." And the other thing is, is that because of Moore's law, the, the technology is getting smaller all the time and faster all the time. So, whereas today I have to run this in a big computer, like we would have done ten years ago, saying, "Well, I need to render this. I render this 3D thing. I need these three computers to do the job." Now I can render six, 120 frames a second on this little box down here. Much the same there. We'll be looking at um, those technologies converging and becoming more available and more connected. Um, it's like the, uh, the 3D scanner underneath of the ground is currently like a connect sensor bar, but there is a company that's just released two weeks ago a sensor that connects to an iPhone. So you no longer need the whole computer for that, and that can do full 3D scanning as well. Um, and 
Project Tango does the same job, does this sort of um, up to four meters relative scanning zones. So the technology, we're, we're really on that, that sort of line now where it, it's all starting to come out as the project is developing. Um, so it's exciting times for it. Um, so that's why we're saying, well, let's not worry about the hardware, that'll, yeah. that'll come. Let's use what we've got and cobble it together and then when the software and the hardware is there, then we can patch it to make it work on it. That's, uh, that's right. I'm coming from. My name's Manny, I'm, I'm fine art. Thank you. Um, one thing I noticed is that the on-demand service you're providing is a disaster rate. Mm -hmm. you know, um, does it need to have, um, does, do you need to give people the choice if they want uh, windows in any particular area? Is the primary concern really to be, to be dry and safe? Mm -hmm. um, have you looked at maybe perhaps dropping the phone, it automatically connects you to the uh, app, it automatically connects you to designs, and then they just select which one they want, you can print it and then you ship it. Well that's certainly an option. Um, mm -hmm. the, the advantage of the system at the moment is that it works for both the designer and for a user, yeah. so adding presets would not be a not be a problem and the yeah. advantage is you'd still be able to go and experience it and go well is it going to work for me because yeah. um, one thing I found interesting about the Calais situation yeah. is uh, that um, when the French government did actually drop in containers and say right we've provided these lovely places they're all prepped mm -hmm. they're now struggling to get people to go into them no, I remember. because I remember. they were saying well actually the caravan that the, the guys down the road gave us is great because it's got everything we need in it whereas you've given us this pre-designed solution that doesn't meet yes. our needs so I think there is definitely something to be said for just um, beggars can be choosers without wanting to, you know, there, there is something to be said for them knowing what they need yeah. as well. So this, would, this particular idea would be for a disaster zone, let's just say um, you have uh, an earthquake. Yes, yes. And you decide right, you don't, to support, mm. would, would people really care whether they might not on day one. It's about the space as well. The uh, space yeah. is very important. How many people I'm just allowed? asking, you know, because yes. you know, I've never been in that disaster zone. What would be my primary, you know, what would be my yeah. primary decision? To be yeah, what, what are we sure here is actually thing? just, we just uh, in, in the middle having actually, you can change it to a door, we'll do anything. But what's very important is actually you get the, the right size of shelter for yeah, yeah. So you don't have actually standard size, and you get only one person or four inside. Yeah, uh, that's, okay. that's one okay. of all the most. I just wondered if, if that idea of, of it will it will actually come with the time because we need to think about a shelter evolves, people's situation evolve, uh, and then we are thinking about the medium to long term. Mm -hmm. uh, so then the need will evolve. Maybe they, they don't they, they don't need the shelter anymore, or they can actually change it to someone else. Uh, so, so that's that's all about actually not having a standard uh, habitat, which which uh, really um, stop you from from uh, to, um, to expand or, or well, it stops it being on. disposable, doesn't it? Uh, yes. Because one, one that what, Doris kind of touched on it with his um, with his technologies uh, mm -hmm. talk is that one of the, the great things about modern technology is it's both very hardly, you know, it's strong, strongly designed, mm -hmm. but it's not expandable, it's not adaptable, it's, when it's, when it's beyond its design, it's dead and you throw it away. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have that luxury. Um, yeah. <laughs> so actually having it in, a, in an adaptable system means that, well actually, you know, I've moved in with my neighbour, we're, we're now together, or do we keep our individual habitats or do we take those wall components off and now we can, Jam the two together, and, and we've all seen the sort of the short term become the long term. I think there's wonderful opportunity as well for creating community as well, so we can actually connect uh, buildings together. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to ask whether you would, um, if, if you presented this to uh, people that were you know, having to manage disasters, mm -hmm. what they would get out of this, because it's you know, it's an ingenious setup. Um, I'm just thinking about if you went to, you know, an NGO that actually has the real difficulties of offering disaster relief, what they would say, and I've tested it. I, I did actually um, 
met in London the two of the leaders of the refugee camp in Tel um, before because it's been demolished now. Uh, but actually, they, they really, really liked the idea. And, and what's very, what was actually very important for them is actually that there is people having, yeah, as I was saying, one person living in a container, and next next door there is ten people inside, uh, which is not fair. And because there is all the gangs, the mafia, and everything ruling, there is a lot of money in the, in the refugee camp uh, going on, and, and it's all about actually appropriation of the, of the space. Uh, so they they really like this in. in this, this, uh, this point of view, um, and then as well in terms of safety, the, the, the shelters which are provided are not safe uh, in terms of uh, actually breaking in, uh, in terms of uh, fire uh, fire issues. Because what happens is that the, when one of their shelters in, in Calais um, burned down, there is plastic inside uh, a plastic membrane which actually melts onto people. So they do they cook food. So, so with this, actually, we can have the shelter which is adapted. So we, we put some extra ventilation in one of the panels. We, uh, we, we change the panel, so instead of having something which is through printing, it could be aluminum or metal, for example. But all uh, keep always keeping the same standard. So they, they, they really like the idea. And, and we will actually go moving forward to meet the government uh, in a few months' time um, before this actually uh, we got the news that it's going to be Thanks. demolished. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, so we gonna uh, try to, to look for another refugee camp and, and, and get the truth through the people. Uh, yeah, um, again, apologies. Uh, slightly complex series of questions. Um, I still think the value. I think you you this has got traction. It's got momentum. It's got a volume of ideas in there. So it's time to stand back. And I've always thought that the value of this isn't in the actual object. It's in the sort of concept of it. I think this falls into the category of a product service system. You're not just designing the object, but you're considering holistically the supply chains. And I think it, what you're doing <coughs> today uh, to expand the project from when I last saw it is that you've broken down into three. It's about the logistics of the supply chain, the speed with which you can respond, as well as the adaptability of the product, the, the shelter. And that's in a non Fordism world. You can have any color you want, so long as it's black. You're actually utilizing sort of new new technologies and new supply chains to actually provide adaptability and modularity. But I think the real thing, and that in itself can be written up um, because it's new knowledge and we can learn from it. But I think the real exciting bit for me is this thing about consumer choice in a complex world, in that you can have everything, oh my God, but you're providing a mechanism to let them make decisions and again i think that is probably sort of one of the most exciting things but in terms of the actual project i think what the, the shelter is very much a, a what if you're using it as a vehicle to explore some more complex and more exciting ideas sorry that's okay <laughs> thank you yeah i think uh yeah you're definitely touching on a lot of um future convergence of technologies and certainly with the government's BIM agenda this building technology and virtual reality is certainly the growth area and the push legislatively for 4 d um, so to see projects through time for construction workers to see in virtual reality to interact with spaces etc etc my biggest concern and I think obviously this, it wasn't covered in the presentation was about the viability of drone use for your supply chain. Certain payloads are uh, yes, legally <laughs> acceptable. And if you change the material condition of the module shelter, then it's not viable. Also, drones don't fly that in certain places or within certain temperature ranges. They become sort of dead objects in, in, some, in some sense. Mm. So I think there's been a lot of work on this side, and that's really interesting to see. But also, <coughs> we'd reach out to you and, and uh, not self-promoting here, but my book on growing futures talks to a hundred different mm -hmm. practitioners from around the world yeah. and use them and see the sort of future convergence and application in both construction and management projects. Mm -hmm. So I think that part of the logistic of, of connecting all the ideas needs to be sort of talked about a bit more yes. from what you're doing. Um, and that connects the chain of 
for the people in the emergency shelters come down to the virtual reality. And also you should set the context that emergency shelters are actually one of probably the well, in the later architectural modernism of one of the fascinating subjects, certainly from Buckminster the Fuller's perspective of geodesic domes as both helicopter shelters and emergency disaster shelters as well. So there's a lot of work being done in there from architects uh, to <coughs> make these sort of spaces. So I think that should be an enriching part of the process. Um, should she go about as well? Absolutely. Um, yeah, no, thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, I could obviously haven't talked about in that in the presentation, but I think all of the parts of there is it's, it's uh, interesting to develop. Also, I think that at uh, university level, the technology should be there um, for you to do this. Uh, geography has three phantoms. They've got Inspire. Okay. They've got the, the drone capability at the moment. But um, and obviously, you're in contact with engineering. Yes. But there should be also a sort of technological support, not just led by GIVO, for you to have a testing phase at least, um, yes. rather than sort of relying on cables and, and purple projectors to just have the real stuff where you can actually have a serious test and make it viable um, in the second phase of NGO presentation. Mm -hmm. so I, know, I know you're looking at a physical prototype at the moment. Then you're in yes, we are actually. So the, the, I'm actually working with uh, uh, two uh, engineering students and two uh, business students <coughs> as well to, to actually uh, 3D print uh, a half a scale uh, prototype, so of uh, one person shelter. So it would be as as big as this, as tall as that. As that. Um, so we're looking at what, actually uh, how to get funding to get the printer and, and start printing something and starting the experimenting. Because for now, uh, all of this is actually a one to ten scale. So when you scale it up, you encounter new <coughs> issues, new problems. Uh, so we, we want to go half a scale first before we go to to. So we're looking to actually uh, what kind of materials we're going to be using, uh, how to, to play the, the map, how to actually uh, recycle uh, plastic waste. Because yes, in Calais there has a very big problem of waste of plastic and how we can actually transform this waste into building material uh, by actually uh, combining it with uh, different fibers, natural fibers. Um, so that's, um, that's very, uh, very important. Um, yeah, in terms of drones actually, it's, it's I thought about using drones because uh, during uh, emergency situation, uh, earthquakes, um, tsunami, there is uh, so many different zones which, which are non-accessible by trucks, by boats, uh, and then actually the drone able us to actually just uh, fly over something, so by air everything is pretty much accessible. Uh, so that's one of the main reasons, but um, in the middle so I'm going to have uh, a series of uh, three different talks. So today was uh, the VR. We're going to be talking about uh, 3D printing next time, and the next uh, stage will be as well uh, about drones. Um, so, yes, there is a lot to explore, um, but this is actually probably at this stage because for now we can still transport those. It's the size of the container when, when it's packed all together. So we transport, we can transport them using traditional uh, transportation uh, methods. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I'm wondering just generally, um, I, you know, I take. Paul's point about we haven't got sadly infinite resources, but we have to think you know, about how we can support this work, and it's absolutely you know, I think it's very worth supporting. Uh, you know, I've had conversations with Sylvia and, and Paul, um, and what I'm wondering is is there an is there any mileage in setting aside an afternoon where we had we'll, we'll do it well in advance where we had something like do you remember the, the round table? Event at the Hacker Lab, because mm -hmm. yes. I know you know because I know everybody's research pretty well. I'm aware that in the design research group, there's a hell of a lot going on that other people would find out about. Um, is there any mileage do you think in having a you know a get Julie help fund a half day round table? We've probably got people outside that we would want to invite in, and I know with Paul's work, the kind of work that you've done with um, well in Garden City, the kind of work that you've done with Susan. We've got the Centre for Sustainable Communities. Now, obviously, I think when we develop this work, we need to be forensic. We can't take on too much. We need to really, really target what we're going to do and make sure we you know, do the best of the best, if you will. 
Uh, but I'm, do, do colleagues think there's any kind of mileage in that? Well, I mean, from my point of view, I would say that's what yes. I mean, what, what I try to do, I try to condense everything in a series of nine lectures, which was really sure, different. Sure. So something has been left out. Yeah. So if we, and then of course there have been some selection as well uh, within you know each of us is working on multiple projects I suppose. And yeah. Of course because you have you are given twenty minutes or half an hour to present your project you have to select as well. So there is a selection in the selection. So if we can have an afternoon for instance event where we can maybe have a bit more time to discuss that that would be quite that would be nice. Also showing different projects or including People. I mean, one of the things that happened that colleagues might not have kind of registered is that there's a the vice chancellor is sponsoring something called um, Feeding the World with Fun with the Food um, theme, and that's actually worth looking at uh, because you know I was talking to him and he said, "Is there any way in which Craig Barts can tri contribute to this?" And well, not in kind of a direct way, but there's but if you think about ideas of supply chain. Uh, logistics. It relates to Doris's work. It clearly relates to this, and I know, I'm sure there are connections with Paul and Sylvia's work, and not least other work in, in, in the room. So, yeah, I, you see what I'm getting yeah, at. Yeah, I'm yeah. trying to find ways in which other people outside our community would have a stake in this. I'll be good for additional fundraising as well. I mean, on this note, I can say that to what I noticed in the two presentations that. There seems to be a moment when a project gets stalled somewhere and then until there is an external collaboration then the project is, is, yeah, is yeah, going yeah, to be yeah. slow. But once there is a collaboration, whether with um, anthropology or whether with you know it comes different skill set, yeah. then the project I mean I saw this project growing from uh, as you mentioned from the master level to you know to this stage. And the more the more the external contribution are Kind of the bigger is the project, so I think I mean that's a very good example of trying to collaborate within. I mean, I suppose that's the difference between having a research group as a wide thing, as opposed to a very specific. You know, for instance, in architecture, we all have very specific uh, type of research groups. Well, in this one, I suppose it's, it's a richness. Can I also add something? Um, <coughs> sorry, it's uh, it's kind of important to discuss to kind of not only collaborate but also inform each other physically. So um, the three of us actually we have decided to start a new project uh, about uh, virtual reality. And um, just sorry, sorry. So I can <laughs> yeah make sure uh, that you're on the camera shot. Oh yes. Uh, so we, we decided to <coughs> kind of embark on a new project that involves uh, virtual reality and we want to uh, get all the all the different awards uh, involved into it. Now, how involved they will get kind of depends on the different awards and, and if they can see uh, any value to it. So, what we decided to do as a first stage is to kind of offer you and offer everyone in the school the possibility of going through of us demonstrating the technology and demonstrating the possibilities of virtual reality, and then we let the program leaders or the people from the courses to kind of decide by themselves if they see any value to it and if they believe that this is something that can positively contribute to it. So by, we decided to do two things. First of all, uh, we're going to organize a day where we're going to demonstrate the HTC Vive system to everyone and they can get to play around with it and see what these capabilities are. And second, we think that they approach you about it. We want to create a student's exhibition where we get students from the different awards and get, allow them to play with virtual reality and create something in an environment, a tool that we have identified. So it's basically like a drawing tool inside virtual reality. So what we want to do is allow the students to play in that environment and produce some work which we are going to later uh, 3D print and we want to exhibit somewhere in the gallery. So it's going to be a student's exhibition using a brand new virtual reality uh, environment which just, just came out and we're going to see how it translates. So it basically educates the students about virtual reality and also educate up to a point, inform the staff about the possibilities of each. 
So we're going to be approaching you in the next couple of one or two months with this. And if you guys are interested, it would be lovely to. I was thinking more of um, external links. Uh, I mean, I think that's a great idea. Um, you know, research informed teaching is one of the things that we're all concerned about. So I completely support that. But I'm wondering, you know, when we think about how good this work is and how we then start to take it to the next stage, um, are there, you know, are there a range of pe external people with established research profiles, with commercial links maybe, that you've been working with anyway? Because, you know, this is, um, you know, this isn't kind of embryonic research at one level. It's working, you know, it's, it's in a relatively high level of sophistication. Are there people from outside the university, international collaborators, that should, we should be inviting? So absolutely we do stuff locally and invite program tutors, but we also, you know, if there are people that you know from other universities. With, um, with this particular project, we started to talk and we were looking to merge that with the Craig Converge. Um, That's right, as Peter's doing. Yes, Great. So okay. like we've got via Erbia University College in Denmark Great. and Abate in Scotland, okay. both okay. university partners in there. Have equally bought the same piece of kit, so right. they share the they share the platform. So we'll be looking at where and how we can draw that. Right. Is that on the GVL website? Uh, we still don't have the GVL. Oh, so yes. speaking with Kim, uh, Kim Jack, <laughs> speaking with Jack about getting a, a blog up of our projects and things we're working on. Yeah, um, but it's again, it's the idea of you know, we all need to, to to know this stuff. Definitely, yeah. I think it applies to everybody. They work. You know, we're doing stuff at a high level. That is clearly replicable. Sorry to bang on about it, but that's what pays you know, our bills. Um, that's clearly replicable. Um, and we need to bring somebody over to help us, or anything else we need to do to get the projects to the next level. We'll do our best to do it. It's really impressive stuff. Good. Any final Great. remarks, or shall we just close it? I'm going to get the sack now. Okay. So half an hour later. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Okay, thank you.